I'm also blessed by, by what we heard um, because I really feel in my spirit it's time that the church come, we have to come back to a place where it's all about Jesus. It can't be about the blessings. It can't be about anything else. It has to be back who is Jesus, the center of it all. Right? And um, I'd like to begin with 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It says this. Verse 16 says, But who, whenever someone turns to the Lord... The veil is taken away. Now we heard that. I think was it Josiah or some, somebody was sharing about, about you know, to open oh, oh, several people. I think uh, Jackie said the same thing. Lord, remove, remove the things that. So when we turn to the Lord, it says the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. See, there are such truths here. Are you living in freedom or are you living in bondage? And that should give you a revelation whether you're seeing the Lord or not. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect. I like this. We can see and reflect. Right? What do we see and reflect? We see and reflect the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Right? So, the good news is, as we are on this journey of being witnesses to Jesus, displaying Jesus in our lives, that's our goal as a church. Our goal right now is, how can I display Jesus in my life? Is there a glimpse of Jesus in my life? Right? We just have to, first, it begins with honesty. It begins with honesty. And say, I've been a Christian for so long, but do people see Jesus? Or do they see a complainer, a grumbler, a pointer of fingers, a murmurer? What, what do they see? An angry person? What do people see? Do they, see, do they have a glimpse of Jesus? It doesn't matter how long I think I've been a Christian. If there's no, there's nothing about Jesus, if I'm not a witness to him. Right. Jesus' last words, final words, before he left this earth, as he met with his disciples was, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and then you shall be a witness to me. Right. And I believe in this time and season, this nation needs Jesus more than any other time. Right? I believe every time they needed it, but because we are here right now, we feel it even more. Right? And the only way they will see Jesus is through us. Right? It's not having 10 God TV channels and everyone suddenly zoom coming onto God TV and seeing some foreign preacher preach and everyone is going to get saved. No, not going to happen. The way it's going to happen is through you and you and you and you and you and me. It's going to be when we start displaying Jesus. right? Why? Because that has always been the method. If you talk about how the New Testament church went, that is how it grew. right? So the method hasn't changed. What has to change is our sense of responsibility towards the method of God. right? I'm sorry, this sounds a little strong, but hey, listen, strong is what we need right now. We need strong because Christianity is too weak right now. The form of Christianity being seen is absolutely weak and is laughed upon. Right? So to get strong, we need to get strong and get back. And what, what does God say? How did God set up the church? What was God's expectation? What did Jesus say before he left? Right? And that is what we are pushing. That's what we are going to uh, uh, focus on at this time. At this time. But I also want to capture um, what has happened thus far during this service. From what we heard. From the time of worship. From the different messages. Because it's all, all connected. No one spoke to anybody else. But it's all connected. In fact, I have this story that I want to share. It talks about a lady who watched a jeweler as he was purifying gold. And as he was purifying gold, he explained to her that refining gold, he needed to hold it under the flames where the, the, where, where the flames were the hottest to burn away all impurities. Right? Gold had to be kept in absolute heat 
so that it burns away impurities. Okay? He said that he had to watch very carefully because if it was left even a moment too long in the flames, it would be destroyed. Right? The gold changes its form. If not long enough, the impurities will be there and it will snap easily. The lady was silent for a moment. Then she asked, but how, how do you know then? There is no meter. How do you know? How do you know? He asked the, the, the jeweler, how do you know when it is, re, when it is ready, when the, you know, it's actually uh, refined? Well, the jeweler said, that's easy. That's really easy. It's not difficult. It's easy. He answered, he says, when I can see my image, when I can see my face reflected on it, I know that's when it's ready. That's when the gold is ready. Right? And that's something like what we read in 2 Corinthians 3. We behold him in a mirror. When we look at that gold, that gold actually, pure, pure gold is like a mirror. It's like a glass. You know, the reason I'm saying this, I know many of you feel you are in a fire at this time. And that was confirmed in what was just said earlier on. Many of you here today, you cannot even think of becoming like Jesus. Why? Because of the issues you're going through. And the reality is your emotions grab you and, and all you can see are these mountains which we spoke against and withered dried trees, fig trees. To be specific is what we've got in the word. But I believe right now God is saying, so either speak to them as Pastor Shamika was sharing, but be ready to be transformed. All this is happening for a reason. All this is happening in your life for a purpose. Not to destroy you. Not to destroy you. But that when people see that you will start reflecting Jesus. It is all for that. The sad thing is I wish there was another way to purify us. There isn't another way. There isn't a shortcut. It is through trials, it is through trials and testings that the genuineness of our faith comes out. It is in the trials and the testings and you know, I, I, I can't anymore Lord, is when you, you find out who he is. When you find out who he is. So I just want to encourage you. You know, don't say, okay Jesus on display, once my problems are over. No, it will never happen. It will never happen. I like that image of a herd of, of, of cattle, you know, of, of being beaten. If you are walking, constantly looking back and say, where did I mess up? Lord, where did I mess up? When is it going to hit me? When is bad, something bad going to get happen? You've got it wrong. Jesus leads us, but we have a responsibility to keep looking out for Jesus, which we don't want to do. We just want to sit and wait, fix the problem, then I'll get up. No, it doesn't work. Look out. He is leading. Follow him. And in doing what he's called you to do is where you find purpose and blessing. Not when your problem is sorted to then find blessing. No, it doesn't happen that way. Follow his leading. My sheep hear me and they follow me. In the following, it takes you looking. You need to look for him. People can't look for him and show you Snapchat pictures and WhatsApp pictures and say, it doesn't work in your life. For it to work in your life, you have to see him, you have to follow him. That's, and I'm telling you, and when you start walking with him, that's when you start thinking, oh gosh, wow, this is awesome. I never knew this about you. I never saw this about you. And what's that? Oh, wow. How, what, what, you know, how, how did this get sorted out? That's the thing. Your intellect and wisdom is going to say, no, 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 no. Let him fix all this. When all this is sorted out, then we'll try to see what we can do for him. I'm telling you, it doesn't work. It's a different kingdom. It's a different kingdom. So it's different principles. Not what you and I learned from childhood in school. Not what you and I learned from all the books we read on leadership and this and that. No, 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 no. This is a different kingdom, different principles. So I want to encourage you this morning. Pursue, look for the shepherd. Where is he leading you? Fix your eyes on him. 
And as you do that, I'm telling you, he's going to transform you and me so that this nation would see what a genuine Christian looks like. See, you and I may not get all the fame. You and I may not be on TV. You may not be on the newspaper. But lives will see. Other lives will be impacted. Amen? Amen. Three people. Okay. We finished. Or not, we can never finish. But for two weeks... We looked at the compassion of God. What it means to be people who who are functioning with compassion. Because until you and I have compassion, you and I will never pray from our hearts for this nation. Right? Remember we looked at that. It made a lot of sense. I don't know to me, it made a lot of sense. We also looked at our compassion, the lack of compassion. Because when we say we want to pray for our nation, it was always based on the issues this nation is facing that affect me. So we will always pray for the things in this nation that affect me. But godly compassion is to see the pain of people, not the things that affect me. And therefore that's why we've been praying and I'm telling you church, keep praying daily, every day. Show me Lord where I can be like you and show compassion. Every day. So today let's look at another aspect which I believe God wants us to see. How many of you, of you want to be great in the kingdom of God? You want to be great? Little great, because you just did this. You want to be like fully great? <laughs> On a serious note, think about that question. Do you want to have, when you go to heaven, to say, oh, he lived. He lived. He lived on earth. Or would you like, One day for the Lord to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Mm. So then you decide, because for that, you must have a desire to be great in the kingdom here. You must have a desire to say, Lord, I want to be great here, no matter what it costs me. Uh, That's the word we don't like. What will it cost me? I want greatness without a cost. It doesn't happen. Greatness in the kingdom doesn't come without a cost. There is a cost. So if you want to be great, then let's let's all as a church say, Lord, we want to be a great church in this city. We want to be a great church that impacts the nation. We want to be a great church that sends missionaries to the world. Amen. Amen. What's the cost, Lord? No, God does not, God doesn't need our money. Remember that? Giving to the Lord is a, is a privilege we have. We get to partner with Him. He doesn't need. He doesn't need. But how? How do you become greatest? You become greatest by being like Jesus. The servant. In the kingdom of God, the greatest is the servant. Does that make sense? Absolutely not. It does not make sense. Now please understand that. In your human brain and my human brain does not compute. Like I said, that's a completely different kingdom and that's where you and I need to choose which kingdom we're going to live in. The kingdom of this world with the intellect of man and the systems of man or the wisdom of God and the rewards of God. Two kingdoms. Many of us want one foot here and one foot here. It doesn't work. You can't have two kingdoms. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. You will love one and hate the other. So you can't. Sorry. No can do. So let's dive in. Philippians 2. 5 to 11. Can we read it together? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Now let's pause there for a minute. Does that sound like Christianity of today? Absolutely not. We want a reputation. But Jesus made no reputation. Doing what? Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man and, and being found in the appearance of a man, he, can we say that again? He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Even death on the cross. Oh, now verse 9, first word is a very important very important. 
Therefore. Right? Therefore, let's read again. Sorry. Sorry for interrupting. God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow on, and in those in heaven, those on earth and those under the earth and every tongue can confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. Let this mind be in you. The same mind. We have to have the same mind that Jesus had. Right. But let me ask you, how many of you think you have this mind? How many of you can say, yes, I live a life as a bond servant. Yes, I'm so humble. I don't want any reputation. I don't want anybody to tell me, well done. I just want to you know, just do everything and go unrecognized. Some of you are unrecognized. You want to be unrecognized, but that's, that's, that's not humility. Sometimes it's not humility. But we have to change. See, Jesus is talking about, Paul is telling us, you and I have to look like Jesus and have the same mind that Jesus had. He said, he's talking to the church here. He's talking to the church in Philippi. And he said, listen church, every believer, you have to be like Jesus. You have to have the mindset of Jesus, which is humility. See, we have a long way to go. Better late than never, right? Better late than never. So let's start now working on humility. Let's start working now. You see, Jesus is always, Jesus, the amazing thing about Jesus, he always led by example. He led by example. And can I tell you, our young people need examples. And that's why you and I have a responsibility. Not just for ourselves, but we have a responsibility for generations that, that our, our, our God is stirring up right now. They have to see examples. Right? Because they're not satisfied with words. They must see. There are people who see. They're constantly seeing they're seeing examples. They're seeing challenges. They're seeing what is, what, is, you know, what is cool and what is uncool. They're seeing. Everything is through seeing. And therefore, they must see good Christian examples. Our teaching alone won't work. It has to go together. It has to go together. See, and this is why we have to, have to put this mind on. Okay? So, what does he say? Let's go to John 13. 3 to 7. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which was, which he um, which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? <laughs> Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand, but you will know after this. Right? Now I'm jumping to verse 12. We'll get back to that in a bit, but jump to verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and he sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? Now catch this, this is important. You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for I am. Right? He never denied who he was. I am teacher and I am Lord. Right? Get that very clear. And what you're saying is correct. Right? If I, then your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Everybody okay with that? See, you have to understand, you can see Peter's big mouth, but at the same time, you have to catch what was happening to you and I. Uh, you know, sometimes you can't picture the, uh, or get into the mind of those disciples. Washing of the feet was never done. 
by leaders. Washing of the feet was done by slaves. Right? People had smelly feet because they didn't have covered shoes. Right? So you had to walk in all the dust and the muck and everything. And when you entered into somebody's house, a slave would come and wash your feet. Right? Because I believe they didn't have air freshener also at home. Otherwise, like my wife, they'd have gone, chsk, chsk, we're having visitors. Chsk, chsk, chsk. Air freshener, no air freshener. So they washed feet. It was also a symbol of welcoming somebody. You're welcome in my house. You're my honored guest. And so they washed feet. So now, now for Peter, this is crazy. He's like, what are you doing? You know, very often Peter thought Jesus was a bit not so there. He's like, what are you doing? You remember the time when Jesus said, I'm going to die on the cross. He's like, what are you saying? I will never allow that to happen. You know, you know what, you're, what you're on, Jesus? I will never allow that to happen. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Right. So here he is again, doing his thing. <laughs> Washing feet. <laughs> you can't wash my feet. Not possible. You know? See, it's, it's important. Think about it. Today we don't wash our feet. But think about it. If Jesus one day turned up at your house, and you really knew what Jesus looked like, like we prayed today. Right? Because he can walk into your house and right now many of us won't recognize him. So we don't know what he looks like. Right? But here he comes and Jesus talks and he's speaking and he says, I came for the garbage. Kunu, kunu, kunu tika den. What would you say? <laughs> don't be silly, you can't take my garbage. I'll come and give my garbage. I would. Are you crazy, Jesus? Come, please come, come inside and sit and give them the, you know, think of your kunu kare. You're not going to give them a seat in your house, right? You won't do that and you won't give them their best, your best glasses, right? For them to drink anything off. There are separate glasses for, for helping people and then for your preferred guests, you have different glasses. Those glasses don't go to them, right? You understand? You, you know what I'm saying, right? Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? So the kunukara doesn't get there, but Jesus has come. You're like, please come, please sit, please sit. And Jesus says, no, actually, I didn't come for a visit. I came for your garbage, and you and I go to be, no, no, no. Do you know, do you know, come here, come here, what is this? Jesus today is dry day, wet day. What is the wet garbage at the first time? Because you can't throw garbage. Wet, wet garbage, all that indul smelly one, right? The, the smelly indul one. And I said, do you know, And you will say, you have never done this. What is wrong with you? Jesus has come in. Jesus. We have to show Jesus that I am humble. <laughs> I have to show Jesus. And just imagine we try to do that and Jesus says, sorry. I have to take your garbage because you, don't, you have no capacity to take your garbage. That's what he was saying. He says, you don't understand. It's not just about washing feet. See, it's, it's, it's really hard. Honestly, this humility thing is, is really hard for us. Right? Think about it. What are the examples we have of humility right now in the church? It's very hard. Because ah, we are driven, because the world has changed, because of social media and all these other things that have come. You know, we are grateful for uh, technological advancements, but with that comes all the, 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 the crazy things. Is now everything is about being a celebrity. Even the guy in the smallest of churches, in the, in the middle of nowhere village, he still wants to be a celebrity. He does. Because his wife and his daughter and he will have tic-tac-tuk on their phones and they'll have, oh, sorry, TikTok, sorry, I got it wrong. But you understand what I'm saying, right? We, 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 everyone has this thing of, you know, it's always, everybody needs to come to a celebrity status. And therefore, and because, see, think about it, why do you post on social media? Why do each one of you post on social media? Why? Because you want the people to see the best version of you. Everyone to say, oh wow, you look so nice. You went where? Oh my God, you went there. Wow! You want a wow! Come on, let's be real. We want the wow. What people say, oh, I like, 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 like. Yeah? So now you understand how hard it is to have a mindset of humility. It's almost like, what is this? Ayo, pastor, don't talk this stuff. We like the likes. 
No, but the likes don't transform a world or people's lives. You can't change lives by posting your best version. Is it so you understand how hard this is? It's actually a challenge. You and I have been taught, many of you, see, it's, it's, it's not the same for everyone. Some of you, all your life, you had to fight for what you have. Nothing came easy for you. Nothing came easy. Some of us have had it easy. Some of us had to have things easy. We've had, you know, uh, maybe uh, rich parents or family or, or, you know, so we haven't gone through some of the difficulties other people have. We haven't. But for some of you, everything in your life has been a fight to get. And you had to give everything. You had to fight for it because nobody took notice of you. You had to fight to get recognition because nobody considered you. They called you a loser. And now comes Jesus saying, by the way, I want humility. Sorry? Yeah, that's not the way to live. Are you come and walk in my shoes then. That's what you feel like telling Jesus, right? Come and walk in my shoes. Easy for you to say. No, he went to worse. He understands. He knows. And this is why I'm saying, there has to come a starting point. Let's start somewhere. Because this is a completely different thing. We have read it, you have read it, I have read it, but we don't live it. And until we start living it, Sri Lanka won't see Jesus in us. See, let me ask you another question. If you have gone somewhere, let's talk to, the, to, to, a, to, a, to a restaurant, and there is this, this one guy, this, this guy who's serving, he is so nice to you. He is smiling, he is bowing, he's taken you to the chair, he virtually sits you in that chair, right? And he's like, sir, what would you have? We, have? we have this, this is a little expensive, but this one is cheaper, but it's really tasty. I would recommend this. What would you do? You say, what a guy, man, you tell the manager, fabulous. Why? Because there was a difference in that guy. There was a difference. Beloved, can I tell you, this nation is looking for a difference. One person who can make one little niceness come out of you. One little bit of humility, love and caring and serving someone. Just randomly. And they'll be, hey, there's still niceness in Sri Lanka. I met a person. I don't know about you. We, we as a family believe that if anyone is nice to us, we have to tell them then and there. Don't wait for people's funerals to come and tell how nice they were. They're dead. Tell people while they're living. Appreciate people while they're living. Catch that. Don't wait. Don't talk nice things behind their backs as much as you talk about the bad things behind their backs. The nice things tell them to their face. We are Sri Lankan. We'll never say bad things to their face. But anyway, I can try asking. See, we have to understand this. And this has to change. Because Jesus says, the greatest is the servant. Look at this, Luke 22, verse 24. See, in the account of Luke, this is that same time, right? Washing feet. After washing feet, there was communion. Correct? Now, communion is done. Look, look at the progression. He's teaching them humility. Now he's taught them, you have to be one with me. And he taught them communion. Straight after communion, now there was also a dispute among them. What was this dispute? As to which of them should be considered the greatest. Oh my gosh. And he said to them, the kings and Gentiles exercise lordship over them. Those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so, you, not, not so among you. What is Jesus saying? This can't happen with my people. On the contrary, exactly opposite. He who is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger or the lesser. And he who governs, he who serves, the one who governs, you should serve. For who is greater? He who sits at the table, right? Or he who serves? Jesus is asking them a question. It is the one who sits at the table. Right? He's not saying, he's saying the world has a system, right? And the world says what? The one who sits at the table is greater, right? Yes, that's true. Yet, yet, I am among you as the one who serves. 
Now let me ask you, who, which version of Jesus are we following? Which version of Jesus do you see when you close your eyes to pray to? Yes, we love the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, but which version of Jesus are you going to live on earth? You and I, the Bible says, are made kings and priests. Revelation says that unto our God. He has made us kings and priests unto our God. But we are never called to be kings and priests over each other. Come on, catch this. You and I never, never have we given that kingship and authority and priesthood to rule over each other. Never. God never, never intended a system where kings rule people. It was the people who said, we don't want you. We want kings like everyone else. That's how Israel got a king. God's system was, I am your head, I am your father, and I work with you, my children. But they said, no, we don't want you. We don't want to listen to you. You're scary sometimes. Give us a king. All these other nations have a king. Give us a king also. I mean, Samuel said, Lord, I can't get this. This ungrateful bunch, they just don't want me because I'm the prophet. They, don't. they said, hey, Samuel, calm down. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me, God says. They don't want me. They don't want my system. They don't want me. See, and God is calling us back. He's saying, change the system. Change the system because there is another kingdom at work. That is my kingdom. That's what those words say on top of that beam on the other side. Seek first the kingdom of whom? Of God. Without worrying, without worrying about what you wear, where we will live, what we will eat, what we will eat. Stop worrying about all this. Everybody worries. But your job as believers is to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And He says the things that you need, God will give you. He'll make a way for you to have it. But you have to seek the kingdom. You can't sit up folded arms and say, give me what I need. Doesn't work. There is a seeking. There is a following a shepherd. You have to go behind him. You have to seek him to get what he has for you. Sitting and waiting and shouting, it doesn't come that way. Not in his kingdom. Not in his kingdom. See, it has to change. Secondly, don't negotiate with God's instructions. I'll say that again. We heard that today about wisdom and intellect. That is when we start negotiating with God's instructions. We are brilliant at that now as Christians. We negotiate. When God says humility, you say, yes, of course. The word says so. Why aren't you, uh, 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 you know, uh, showing humility? At Actually, right now, I have a good reason. And then you come out with your reason as to why you can't show humility. I agree. I agree. You're right, Lord. Forgive enemies? Absolutely. But right now, actually, right now, I'm not forgiving. It's a, I have a good reason. I have a good reason, Lord. And you start giving excuses as to why you can't do what he just said. Though you're agreeing with what he said. No, no, no. You're right, Lord. You're right. You're right. But actually, right now, I can't do it because, oh, and we are so justified. Oh, you don't know the hurt offense, how to forgive right now. Wait, just give me some time, Lord. Where did you say? Forgive your enemies within three years. Did Jesus say that? <laughs> Love your enemies within three days? No. He did not tell us and say, you can stretch it out. Obedience to me is now. Obedience to me is now. We don't like it, no? It doesn't matter what we don't like right now. Let's get it right. Let's go beyond what I like and I don't like. Yes, I don't like a lot of things. But we have to get it right. Because doing Christianity the way I like and don't like touches nobody. It actually we become a stumbling block to others. Let's not become stumbling blocks. So don't negotiate. What does Peter do? Peter says, like we said, I'm not going through everything. He says, no, 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 not my feet. Then Jesus says, listen, Pete, you don't understand. <laughs> he, says, he says, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus said to him, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. Oh, you can, you can, can you, I'm a visual person. I'm like, Simon Peter's face changing. Oh, 
Mm. If I don't wash my feet, then I can't be a part of you. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Simon said to him, Lord, 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 Lord not my feet, all of me. <laughs> what a guy, what a guy. Not just feet, Lord. If you're washing their feet, wash their feet. But for me, oh, full bath, Lord, full bath. Again, what is that? His theory. His theory. I can get more than what God said I can have. Firstly, I don't want to do what God said He's going to do. Now you're feeling a little convicted. Now I want more than what God said. He didn't say, I'm going to wash your body. He said, I'm going to wash your feet. <laughs> but you think you're very spiritual when you say, no, I want more. No, just stick to what He said. That is enough. Because He said it. That's where it is in. The breakthrough is in that. The forgiveness of sin is that. What was Jesus telling him? I love this. Don't you love? Jesus is teaching them humility. At the same time, he's teaching them what forgiveness is. And he's saying, listen, unless you're a part of me, I mean, unless I wash your feet, you can't be a part. He said, you figure this out. What was he saying? When I'm dying on a cross, you realize because you're with me, you are already bathed because, you, because I'm your Lord and Savior. Your sin is sorted out. Your sin is taken care of because you are, I am your Lord and Savior and teacher and everything like you said. Therefore, that's fine. But I have to wash your feet. And for me, I see this as, listen church, you and I have been forgiven. Amen? Amen. But you and I have to regularly wash our feet, which is you and I have to repent for the uncleanness that we carry. There has to be a regular washing of feet. There has to be a place of repentance daily. We are forgiven once and for all. That's why he said, you are washed. If I was Peter, if you are washed, then why are you washing? Feet also. No need, no. you said washed. Already bathed. He said, no, but you don't get it, Peter. You don't get it. You have to have regularly wash your feet. You have to ask, you have to repent for your sin as well. I have forgiven you. And, and this is something I want some of us to catch today. When you came to Jesus, he made you a new being. I'm sidetracking, but I, but I felt the urge from the time I was preparing this sermon. Because you're struggling. You're struggling with this. Am I really a new being or not? Every time you get your feet dirty, am I now no more in him? He says, no, you are because I have bathed you. But you have to wash your feet. You have to repent. It doesn't disqualify you from being my child. But you can't bring that stinky stuff you have to deal with it. I washed, I paid. I have paid for your stinky stuff. I in fact wash your feet to show you that I paid for your stinky stuff. But you have to wash your feet. See, the world tells us today, there's nothing called wrong. There's nothing called sin. There's nothing called sin. Everything is permissible. It's actually the level. The level. Like what? Sin is sin, dude. No, but it's a level. It's actually the intention. Man, intellectualize. Oh, we try to make it this and that and we paint it and put colors of the rainbow around it and, we, and say all this vibgyo. And that's okay. It's not okay. If the word of God says it's not okay, it's not okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You can't, you and I can't use our intellect and tell God, actually what you said, let me tell you, Lord, you said it's sin, but... You, you don't really know what you said. I do, and all these people, all my friends of mine, we know you don't. You just, sorry. That's what we're doing. See, you and I are going to get dirty. You and I are going to get our feet dirty. But don't justify the stench you're walking in and say, Lord, forgive me. I don't know, I just keep ending up in puddles. I don't know about you, I end up in puddles very often. And I'm like, Lord, oh, feet dirty again. But I don't say, what's the point, man? Feet are going to get dirty anyway. No, I don't. I go back and say, wash my feet, Jesus. See, we have to do that. Don't justify our sin. But don't keep living in doubt, thinking, am I a child of God or not because I sin? No, you are still a child of God because you made him Lord and Savior. Now you have to deal with your flesh. Your spirit is saved, but your soul is not. Now I sound very angry. I'm not angry. I'm just passionate right now, okay? Sometimes people listen and say, my gosh, your past is angry. I'm not angry. I'm just very passionate right now. 
You see, and this is what I'm trying to say. You have to wash our feet. Don't make excuses. Repentance is key. Be quick to repent. Don't analyze. See, very often when you feel justified, then what God told us to do is not relevant because I justify. Sometimes I have fights with my wife. You know, and I know it's wrong. I know it's arrogance. I know I'm wrong. But I'm justifying as to why I should not say sorry. And I will justify. Because I don't feel, I feel it's weakness to say sorry. Because my father never said sorry. My father would beat me when my brother did something wrong. And then when my mother said it was not me, he'll call my brother. Or he wouldn't even call my brother. And he would never say sorry to me. Do you think a man like that knows how to say sorry easily? No. It has to be God then. But I thank God he is God of my life. So he allows me and he pushes me to say sorry. Not just to her but even to my children when I'm wrong. I'm telling you. If you desire it, he will do it. But you have to desire it. You have to desire it. And we have to be such people. Then the world will see that we belong to Jesus. See, you can find a million people who will join you and say, yeah, yeah, you're justified, you're justified. But you know what they're saying? Yeah, yeah, you're just like me. Yeah, I understand you because we're same, same, right? You're like, yeah, I'm same, same, but I know Jesus. And therefore, I can't stay in my place of justification. I have to do what he said. So I choose to forgive. That's when people see you that you're a Christian. It is not weakness. Humility and meekness is not weakness. Why? Because humility, catch this, humility and meekness is a choice. It is a choice. Some of us think we are are being humble. We are not. We are defeated. In a place of defeat, you have no choice. You just have to take it because you're defeated. But humility is a choice. Meekness is a choice. Meekness says, I can get back at them. Yeah, but I won't. Because the Lord said not to take revenge. I won't, I won't take back. That's meekness, by the way. You have the power to do something and you choose to do what is right according to God when you have the power to destroy them. Humility is not because I have no choice. I have no choice. You have a choice to serve. It is a choice. That is why it is not weakness. Weakness is when you have no choice. I have no idea what to do, man. No choice. You're weak. But to be meek and to be humble, you have to be strong. You have to know your identity. As Jesus said, it begins. Jesus, knowing that he came from the Father and is going to the Father, therefore, he took a towel. Are you catching what I'm saying? Jesus knew. He said, I am, I am from the Father. I am going to the Father. I know who I am so I can wash feet even though I'm a king of kings. I can wash feet because I know who I am. You and I, when you and I know that we are a royal priesthood, come on. We are the sons of the Most High God. Humility is not a struggle. It shouldn't be a struggle. Your flesh, you say, don't, don't. It hurts. Ow, ow, don't. But you say, no, but I'm going to obey him. I'm going to obey him. Because I know who I am in him. I can't lose by obeying God. I can't lose by obeying God. I'm telling you, you can't lose by obeying God. It may feel like it for a while. But can I tell you, he's a rewarder. He's a rewarder of obedience. Man, he will reward you for his obedience, for that obedience, for obeying him. See, that's what he did. See, until we catch that identity, you and I will never wash the feet of Judas like Jesus did. You and I will never. I'm talking about, let's look at this church for now. Okay. How many of you will, will stay away from some others, from some people because they hurt you or did something wrong? You don't want to look at them more, so you look down and walk. When you see them, you will go from the other door. See, it has to change. We have to change. We have to change. And that's what he wants us. We have to be willing to wash the feet of Jesus, of Judas. It says, And after supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Right? So Jesus knew when he was washing the feet of Judas, he knew what he was going to do. He knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. 
Are you like, see, are we like Judas? See, what was Judas at the table for? What was Judas doing with them? Yes, but what, what was his purpose of following Jesus? But exactly, he had an ulterior motive. My motive is, if I follow Jesus, I can, oh man, he's going to be successful. This guy is doing stuff that no other human being has ever done from what I've seen. He, 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 did, he healed what? Oh, I'm on this one. He healed, he healed the sick. I'm with him. Something awesome is going to happen. This, I think this is going to be a good venture for money. So he was there for an ulterior purpose. Why are you following Jesus? Is there a bit of Judas in you right now? Are you following Jesus because what he can get you and make you successful and this and that and the other? See, I think there's a little bit of Judas in all of us. But we need to get him sorted out that he doesn't kill himself and cause us to kill ourselves. But instead we need to repent. Repent. Jesus washed his feet because I believe Jesus still loved the man. It was almost go do what you have to do. Jesus didn't want him to hang himself. He washed his feet in love. I believe you have to do what you have to do. You will fulfill scripture. I will be betrayed. I know. But I don't want the betrayer to die. And you know, I, 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 even after betrayal, repent and come. Like Peter. You know, this is what he's saying. We must be willing to do that. We must be willing to do that. Why? Because there's a blessing in doing. Listen, we end that. Most assuredly, verse 16 to 17, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. Then he says what? If you know them, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed are you if you do them. See, knowing is not enough. See, that's the problem with intellect. Intellect is important. We all need intellect. Don't foolishly believe and follow and listen even to a sermon like this without intellect. Go home and check if what I'm saying is correct or not. Use your intellect, but don't let it supersede the Spirit of God. Don't let it supersede. Don't, like I said last, uh, last week, don't analyze to paralyze. Don't. Don't analyze so much that it ends up with paralysis. Nothing happens because you analyze and analyze and analyze. But allow the Spirit of God to say, this is me, son. This is me, daughter. Go for it. Do it. This person, yeah, I know you don't like them. But just do it. I'm telling you. Again, like I said, the kingdom is different. The reward system is different. The reward system is different. You and I, very often, let's say Samala has done something wrong to me and I have to, I have to forgive her. Now what am I doing? When I forgive her, I want her, I want her to be a blessing to me. I'm looking, now, now I forgive you, now what? What are you going to say? Right, Mama? Sometimes we have a fight. Like I have said sorry, now what are you? But don't you have anything to say? <laughs> no. Just to annoy her? No. I said sorry, you don't, have to, you don't want to say sorry? Ah, yes. Sorry. <laughs> it happens. But see, I want you to understand. Listen, listen, church. There is a reward. His system is different. When you obey him, he will reward you. Right? The reward comes. The reward comes in obedience. It's so important. You see? And that's what he says in the end. If now you know, you heard. If you do them, blessed are you if you do them. This morning, can we ask the Lord? Can we all just, you know, go before the Lord this morning and say, Lord, I don't know where to begin. I don't know where to begin because this concept I have heard, doing is so much harder. Hearing is so much easier. But if you're calling me, to walk in humility, if you say the greatest is a servant, then help me today, Lord. Help me. Would you help rewire my head, my brain, my intellect? Would you rewire this? Where life has taught me that if I'm humble, people will walk all over me. Therefore, I've done life 
having to be a fighter. Lord, now teach me to be a truster instead of a fighter. Teach me to trust you. Teach me to trust your word. Teach me to trust your word that it goes beyond my feelings and emotions. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Would you help me? And if you're genuine, I would say, please keep asking this till you see change. I'm telling you, change will come if you pursue. If you pursue Him, He, as we read at the beginning, the Lord who is the Spirit will transform you into the image of Him from glory to glory. It is the Spirit of God who transforms us. Church, the Bible also tells us the Lord resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord that He may lift you up. As a believer of Jesus, you and I cannot live with pride. He hates pride. God hates pride. That's the only time He tells, tells us, I will oppose you. God resists, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Father, help us, Lord. This seems so hard. It's not in our DNA right now. But would you give us a fresh DNA based on what, how Jesus had it. How Jesus had it because he knew who he was. Because Jesus knew where he came from and where he was going. Would you refresh that in us to know where we came from and whose we are, who we belong to and where we are going from here. So that we will not have to fight and hold on to our rights knowing you've got our back. That you've got our back. Even when we are accused. Even when we are framed. Even when we are falsely accused and, and when, when, when things happen to us. When we are innocent of such charges. Father, let us trust you that you have our backs. That I don't have to fight for my pound of flesh because you'll give me a whole cow. That I won't be fight, fighting for one pound when you give me a whole cow. Teach us, Lord. Teach us, Lord. None of us are too old to learn. None of us are too old to learn. Teach us so that there will be humility in our schools, there will be humility in our homes. Lord, teach us what humility looks like in our homes. Help us, Lord. Teach us humility in our workplace when we have authority to do stuff, but we choose not to because we are yours. Because we are yours. And because you are the example we are following. Father, once again, I ask you to forgive us where we have followed, thinking we are following a, a celebrity Jesus. Remind us, we are following a bond servant Jesus who gave up everything. Who gave up everything. Therefore, God so highly exalted him and gave him the name above every other name. Father, I pray, show us that you are a reward of those who diligently seek you. That as we follow you, as we run after you, we will see the promises unfold. We will see the breakthroughs. We will see the mountains being moved. We will see the fig trees being removed. Holy Spirit, come and do a new work in us, I pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for every man, woman, and child who's here. Lord, make us this church, your bride that you're coming for. Make us that bride. That we won't look like the brides of this world and think we need all this, that, and the other. But we will look at your 
word and say we want to be the bride that Jesus is coming for. So make us that church. Make me that bride, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you.